Friends, we are back in business here at Betting You over at Odd Chopper College Football Week. We're, we're almost at the end. This is crazy. Week nine is upon us, though. We're in the thick of it. Obviously, conference play has begun. Teams are getting bounced. Big marquee wins. We're going to recap it all. More importantly than that, we are going to look at the betting board for this week. Myself and, of course, Matt Kajewski joins me. And we got a lot to get to. We're going to break down these games and give our best bets. I'll create some interesting scenarios along the way. You guys know the drill here at Betting You. Like and subscribe right off the bat. Let's get it going. Sorry, you were, we were just talking before the show, and you were saying it's kind of crazy some of these teams that we almost have to talk about at this point because they're still undefeated. I mean, what a wacky year so far. I feel like this is very unique for a lot of reasons. It's probably the best possible runout for – excitement in the regular season which was a huge talking point as we expanded to 12 teams in the playoff everyone was saying oh you know the regular season is going to be devalued no one's going to care about these games all we're going to care about is a 12 team playoff that's all nonsense to me because more football is always better in my opinion like i like watching spring games and high school games so i personally don't care but when you have a season like this every game does matter the sec The two undefeated teams in conference are Texas A&M and LSU. They face each other this weekend. At the start of the year, no one was projecting either of those teams in the playoffs. And they still have tough roads to climb. There's a very real chance that both of them don't make the playoff because Georgia is still there. Texas, I think, was the favorite coming into the year out of that conference. And if they keep cannibalizing each other, maybe the Big Ten gets four. Indiana's taking care of business. Penn State doesn't play anyone all year. So, I mean, it's looking pretty good for both of those teams. And then we have some weird rogue undefeateds like BYU and Pitt. I think both those teams catch L's along the way, but it at least makes for a very interesting regular season because like Pitt and Syracuse is a game we have to talk about because Pitt's undefeated. BYU, we need to talk about their game against UCF. They're going to the bounce house. It's extremely important. Not to mention we have the game of the year in the G5, Boise State playing UNLV. So it's a crazy week, if even if it doesn't have like an Alabama-Georgia on the slate. Let's not forget the academies are undefeated, both of them. Oh, yeah, uh, I did. Which is they're, they're going to catch L's, but you're right. They're they are going to catch L's starting probably both of them, and we'll see this week. You know, Notre Dame uh, has both of them. One's at Yankee Stadium. One's, I, I believe, in New Jersey. But that's fascinating. I mean, just shocking. And they're killing everybody now. We'll see. Let's get they into both it, have played combined one team in the top 100. So, yeah. Yeah, it's – it's cool. I don't think it's actionable, but it's kind of cool. Even it's really they're, cool. Um, they're another one. Let's get it started with a little Thursday action. You mentioned it. I'm on totals. We we may talk about a total here or there, but we've got Syracuse and we've got Pittsburgh. I've said for weeks now I want Pittsburgh to stay undefeated because I'm going to absolutely short them at a spot. It's not going to be the spot because I can't. Six and a half, five and a half point favorite. Does Pittsburgh stay undefeated? Simple as that. They're taking money, which is a surprise to me. So I haven't played this yet, but I'm very interested in the Syracuse side. It's not a huge road trip as far as this conference goes. And I think there's concerns with both teams, largely just on defense for Syracuse. And then Pitt has a couple that are more minor, but I think there are more of them. With Syracuse, they've, again, been absolutely horrifyingly bad on defense, but their best player is going to be returning here, Marlo Wax. He was their best defender last year. He's a stud middle linebacker, the captain of the defense, which should help a lot of things. I mean, even, you know, their coverage rating at 85th, Marlo Wax does a lot for this team. So getting him back, I think, is huge, especially when you get, like, your stud back in college. It's more impactful than, like, the NFL and stuff. He's not the only injury, though, like, Deion Wilson's been out at defensive tackle. Kevin Jobody as well. Marcellus Barnes, he's a corner depth piece. He's been out. So they've been pretty banged up on defense, which is really important here because they've been absolutely getting annihilated by opponents. C.J. Bailey of NC State was at 13.7 yards per attempt. Haj Malik from UNLV, 9.1 yards per attempt. Rushers have been getting this team all year long. So I do think first and foremost that's important. Because Pittsburgh's offense hasn't always looked great this season. And I think largely you've had Eli Holstein run hot, 12 turnover-worthy plays, just five picks. That's starting to regress, as we've seen in recent games. Pitt has not been absolutely beating the snot out of teams. And they've been actually fairly fortunate 
at a two point win over Cal before their bye, and then squeaked by North Carolina the week before that. If you just look at raw power ratings, Syracuse comes in ahead of Pitt. And I think both defenses are weak. You know, like Syracuse hasn't done themselves any favors with the injuries, but Pitt is still 52nd in total defense. 72nd in coverage, they're facing an air raid team in Syracuse who's gotten great play out of depth receivers like Zed Haynes, Gadsden's always awesome for this team. And Trevor Pena has been fine too. McCord has 21 big time throws and 11 turnover worthy plays. 11 is kind of an eye opening number until you actually just look at the pass rate for this team and how many raw pass attempts he has. You know, at a certain point when you run an air raid and you throw the ball, 63% of the time, you're naturally going to have more turnover worthy plays than a team like, I don't know, Ohio. So I'm not really worried by that metric. He has 19 touchdowns already this year. Their run game's actually been surprisingly decent. And there is a mismatch on defense that Syracuse could exploit. They're still 35th in pass rush. This pit O line has a lot of concerns. They're 108th in run blocking, 82nd in pass blocking. So applying pressure to Holstein, he's already turnover prone. That worry, that's worrisome to me. You always have to deal with, you know, Desmond Reed being an absolute wagon for Pitt and putting the team on his back, which he could do at any time. But it's a lot of points, man. Syracuse is a quality team. They're a shootout team, but getting waxed back, I think, will help them here. Interesting game for sure. Like I said, it's not one that I even broke down because I can't bet Syracuse in New York. But Pittsburgh has done what they needed to do so far. I don't think they're that good. I don't think they're a serious threat to the top teams in the ACC. But for a little Thursday night action, you could go, you could do worse than this. But it's not the only game during the week that we need to pay attention to in a national standpoint. And you just mentioned this. We got Boise State and, and UNLV. UNLV made waves, not really for their play, but for their, I guess, controversy when their quarterback left. They've still managed to stay relevant. Boise State has, you know, you probably have heard of them. Maybe you've seen them if you stay up late. Just an absolute stud in that backfield. Two and a half to three point spread here. What do you see in the clash of the G5? I'm interested in taking UNLV. Ooh. This is a, like Boise's schedule has been extremely easy this year. Georgia Southern, the game was closer than it should have been. They lose to Oregon. And if you dive into that box score with Oregon, they missed like a, a thousand fourth downs. Yes. Could have been worse. Washington State is reasonable, but they're playing a Mountain West schedule this year. Then they beat up Utah State and Hawaii. And they've allowed some really concerning numbers to opposing signal callers. And I mean, some rushers have gotten them too in that span. Like Boise is a full shootout team. This defense really just has like one decent pass rusher, one decent corner. And then I'm not sure they have anyone else who's competent on this team. 7.3 yards per attempt to Braden Shager of Hawaii. 9.1 yards per attempt to Spencer Peters of Utah State. 8.8 yards per attempt to John Mateer of Washington State. I'm not sure he can throw the ball. He's great at running it. And then of course, like Dylan Gabriel will get you. That is what it is. So, I mean, this defense is pretty bad, and they have some injuries. Sheldon Newton's been missing time, as has Markel Reed at corner. So can UNLV move the ball on this team? I think probably. Boise State comes in 101st in run defense. That's all UNLV wants to do. And Haj Malik Williams has actually been an upgrade on Matt Sluka. In really every single efficiency metric on the ground, he's averaging 6.4 yards per carry. He's a 70.5% completion for 9.5 yards per attempt. Underlying stuff is pretty good, too. Only four turnover-worthy plays. It's a small sample with him. Perhaps with more film, teams will get a beat on Haj Malik Williams, but we haven't seen it so far. And his cast is really good. This offensive line is 51st in pass blocking, 19th in run blocking. He has an NFL receiver in Ricky White, a good gadget guy in Jacob DeJesus. So really all of the cast around him is pretty good. And then I don't think there's any question UNLV is the better defense on this team. Just overall, it's 26 for 68. They might have some NFL guys in their secondary. And this team went out and they did a good job in the portal. I don't know how they retained all these guys. But like getting Catalan, who's a former freshman All-American SEC player, to come play for your defense is huge. They do have a weakness against the run. They're just average in that mark. And Genty, it doesn't matter who he plays. He's going to run all over you. It's kind of just can you limit Genty enough and then – play well in the pass game because Mattis Maxson has not been good. He has seven turnover-worthy plays, two picks. He's run hot in that. 
I think UNLV can do this. They should have success with their offense against Boise's porous run defense. And then they by far have the better defense. And if you can even put some kind of cap on Genty, you can probably win this game. That's really going to be the key. You're going to have to bottle him up to an extent. Uh, are you waiting to see? Because the line is bouncing around. There's two and a half. There's also a th- you, you can find a three and a half out there. You're laying a little extra juice. Are you waiting on a game like this? Or, or are you looking to lock something in now? Or have you? Yeah, just uh, now that you say that, I realize I didn't actually say what I've done. I, I am waiting. I was looking to see where okay. this moved because it has been bouncing all over the place. A three and a half is really enticing to me. That wasn't available yesterday, but that's a number to strongly consider. Yeah, I mean, again, it's just this is it's all over the place and we have some time. So the three and a half pop. Absolutely. These this are, might be the best game of the week. If you watch it's going to be. Game, yeah. Oof. If you watch any game, I would argue this should be the contest. Like Boise right now is the front runner for the playoff. UNLV, they, I don't know how to put this. Like they beat Kansas, but they had a 13% post game win expectancy. Then they lost to Syracuse and they had a 75% post game win expectancy. So it kind of came out in the wash. But this is a really tough schedule compared to what Boise's played. I mean, Boise obviously had the Oregon game, but outside of that, it hasn't been great. So, yeah, I mean, UNLV is a very strong team going to be a fascinating test. This is more, you know, we, we kind of shift gears. Now we get to Saturday with, with some of the more marquee. And you mentioned, you know, the SEC is just insane right now. Teams are going down all over the place. And the dust is emerging. There's got to be, I mean, hear what I'm saying here. Because we know that that's But, like, how many teams do you think control their destiny to the playoff in the SEC right now? Like, seven it's like it's something crazy, I would assume. Eight. <laughs> yeah, I mean, probably. Obviously, they play each other, so that you know, when you say like Vanderbilt controls their destiny, I would say. Yeah, they have one loss. Yeah. There's a there's a ton of one loss teams. Like they're, Vanderbilt, they're team- Texas, Missouri, Tennessee, Georgia, LSU, Texas A and M, which is nuts because. You know, two of the three favorites in this conference are Alabama, I guess maybe not Alabama. Alabama's probably consensus fourth, but in the preseason, the three favorites were Texas, Georgia, and Ole Miss, and Ole Miss already has two losses. Yep. And a head to head to LSU, who's three and oh, who somehow lost to USC and should have lost like two other games, including the Ole Miss one. Including the Ole Miss one, yes. Uh, and then somehow I didn't get paid off on them against Arkansas because all my parlays were dead. That's neither here nor there. Now they got to hit the road. I don't know. I, you know, there, there's just, again, when you play an individual game early in the season, sometimes you extrapolate that data. And the Texas A&M Notre Dame game certainly had some ripple effects for me, particularly with the quarterback situation. Maybe there's some redemption narratives here, but what do you, again, this is a competitive two and a half point spread, hostile environment, LSU. They're getting it done. I don't really love this defense, but what do you make of this game? They've been a lot better on defense the last two weeks. I took some flack for this last week, kind of talking them down, even though it was just a one game sample. So, I mean, I'm not going to really walk that back. They played horribly the first part of the season, but the last two games, they've been much better. And I'll get into that. I don't know if this is a Blake Baker thing or what, or just they figured out their personnel because they've been moving a ton of guys around. Anyway, I'm playing an under in this game. Pace is really bad. LSU is 97th in seconds per play. Texas A&M is 120th. Texas A&M has played just about the easiest four-game stretch in the country, at least as far as SEC goes, over their last four games. They played Bowling Green. They had a 47% postgame win expectancy. They played Arkansas. They had a 37% postgame win expectancy. They lost both those contests. They beat a Missouri team, which has been really weird. They've looked absolutely horrifying at times, not just the Texas A&M game. And they've looked fine at others. So I don't know what to make of that. And then they played Mississippi state, who is the worst team in this conference. So I don't really know what to make of Wegman. He's had some success of late, but underlying stuff is still pretty damn bad for him. And we know that he had the Notre Dame meltdown earlier in the year, completing 61% of his passes, 7.5 yards per attempt. He's seven turnover worthy plays, four picks. And again, he missed a couple games. So these aren't great metrics. The O-line is pretty good for this team, so there is a decent foundation. But the receiving game has not lived up to expectations. And then LSU's defense has played better over the last two games. 
and pretty significantly so. It's still a two-game sample, and I don't know what to make of it. I'm starting to buy in more because, you know, you face Jackson Dart. They did an awesome job against him. And then they played Taylor Green, who is at, at least dynamic. He has plenty of problems himself, and that line isn't any good. But it's nice to see LSU at least put up good games because previously in the first four games, they did not do that. Like South Carolina scoring 36 on you, losing to USC, even like allowing UCLA to put up 17. I know LSU had a ton of injuries in that game. But a couple of things that make sense, getting back Zy Alexander actually gives you a very good defensive back. You can put him around the formation advantageously and take away a weapon on the other side. He's been that good when he's been healthy. He missed time due to a concussion. Up front, I don't know what to make of this. I kind of think they've just been using Harold Perkins out of position really all season long because now that he's off the field and they're actually using some players in like the correct roles, they're getting elite production out of these guys. Like Whit Weeks has been awesome for this team over the last two weeks. So I don't know. I kind of buy the improved LSU defense at least a little bit, and you have Wegman on the other side, of course. Then LSU's offense is facing a very good Texas A&M defense. They're 31st overall. They're 20th against the run. Their weakness is in coverage, but that's also improved. And that was something we expected going back all the way to the early part of their season. Texas A&M's defense was comprised largely of transfers. Thought it was going to take some time for this unit to get it together. They haven't allowed over seven yards per attempt in four straight games. So I think this coverage unit is still improving. You know, sometimes you get their 79th in coverage, but that's front loaded your first couple games, you know, like Graham Mertz diced them up, even though that game wasn't that competitive, but those games are still taken into account in efficiency metrics, even if you've made a big improvement, all this to say pace, defensive improvements, questionable offenses, especially a and This is an under for me. Did you take it already? Do you have a I number? Took it at 54. 54. Okay. Yeah, that's it. They're still out there. 53 and a half at minus 110 sitting on my screen right now. Uh, I want to mention, actually, there's no better time to, to mention this. Uh, you know, you guys have heard about what we're doing over at Tails. It's our marketplace. If you haven't, if you're a new, you said, what the hell is this guy talking about? I never heard of that in my life. Well, it's really simple. Me and Matt and all these other creators, we all have our individual channels where we're dropping bets outside what we're talking about here, talking through things. If you have not been a part of it, it is absolutely awesome. You go here and whatnot, and you can choose any of these marketplaces. But the reason I'm going through all this is not to tell you to sign up to any of that. It's to tell you that you can get months, and that's plural, no matter if you're an active customer, a new customer, a former customer, for free just by signing up with any of these partners, any of them. Look at all these things. So it's very simple. You have to go to this page. I, the link is in the description of this video. You go here and find what works for you. Not only are you getting the bonuses from the site. So like if you have Bet365 in your state, you're getting $200 in bonus bets. On top of when you claim this offer, you get a full month of a Tails Marketplace. So you can get a full month of that. If you do two of them, you can do one and one. One of mine, one of his. Two months of one of us. It does not matter. It is that simple. Again, we have not done this before. You're going to be hearing a lot about it because it's absolutely fantastic. We work super hard to get this in place. You go to this page. You have to do that. You sign up. You follow the instructions. You send an email to our support channel, and you are in. It is that simple. Awesome opportunity to get in with college basketball coming. You do not want to miss it. The value in there pays for itself, and you get all the bonuses. Now, let's get back to the action as I screwed up the odd screen and we're going back, but that's okay. We do things on the fly on this show. This is the game you mentioned because I'm a sick person. If I could watch one game this week, it would be this game. I want to see Navy take on Notre Dame. I don't know if they have a realistic shot, but that's what I want to ask you. I mean, I didn't expect Navy to even be good and they are somewhat good. They're north of double digit underdog. It's almost pushing two touchdowns. You think there's any chance they can move the ball on Notre Dame? Is this the game you're most excited for? Because UMass isn't playing. Yeah, well, they got to buy. You know, they 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 need to rest up because uh, they have Wagner coming up, and that's a that's is a that game win that total. Should... Sorry, not to derail us. Is no. that win total dead? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna I'll I'll throw it back to you. Do you think they can beat Georgia in Georgia? Because if they do that, they have a good chance to cash that win total. But they may need to beat Georgia. Um, 
So they've got Wagner and UConn. They can get those. Then they're gonna have to find one more. I don't think I don't think they're they're getting there. Yeah, I wish they had Auburn. That would have helped because Auburn can't beat anyone. But Notre Dame and Navy. I don't know. Uh, honestly, I mean, it's not like Notre Dame's never seen a triple option before. You know, this is not a random game. Do you think there's anything that Navy can do to cause problems? I don't think so, but I've, I'm not 100% sure here. Navy is really hard to evaluate. We know the triple option is difficult to prepare for. I guess one benefit is this matchup happens every year. So Notre Dame is no stranger to facing yep. the triple option. I'm sure they have some infrastructure in place for, you know, Navy week. And Navy has played the easiest schedule I've ever seen outside of Memphis. The next highest rated team on their schedule is Air Force at 109th, which is not saying a lot. And the Memphis win is awesome. Like everything underlying the Memphis game, they outgain Memphis 10.7 yards per play to 6.9. A lot of that came through the air. I don't know. Memphis is just asleep at the wheel. Navy was at 14.6 yards per pass attempt, and they threw it 14 times. So, I mean, you can tell how explosive some of those plays were. And then they were still at 9.3 yards per carry, which, I mean, if you just isolate defenses, Memphis still comes in 20th. So this is very, very good. Seeing Navy do that in one individual game is a huge data point in their favor. So I'm not really sure what to make of this because none of their other games are worth mentioning. But at the same time, like Notre Dame has played, I don't know, three or four opponents that would arguably be the best team Navy has faced this year. Like, I know Memphis is great. They come in 20th in the power rankings. It's still a G5 team that's in constant shootouts. I mean, they're putting up 100 points every game because their defense can't stop anybody. Like, Georgia Tech would probably be the best team Navy has faced this year. Louisville certainly would be. Texas A&M certainly would be. And, like, Stanford, Miami, Ohio, Purdue, Northern Illinois, those would all be the second best team Navy has faced this year. So, I mean, just the level of competition is vastly different. And Notre Dame is, like, their defense, despite the injuries, losing Morrison and Botello, they've been pretty stifling to opposing teams, especially the run games. Like last week, Jamal Haynes was at 1.9 yards per carry. You have to go all the way back to like Louisville had a decent amount of success there. Otherwise, like very few teams are having actual success running the ball. Even Texas A&M, no meaningful running back. You know, anyone that got like five plus carries was over 4.0 yards per carry. This is the 37th ranked run defense in the country. And there might be room for like improvement there because they faced a difficult schedule compared to what Navy's played. I don't want to completely discount it though. Cause you know, Navy's offensive line grades out well, efficiency wise. I don't think there's any chance they throw the ball here. Notre Dame's third in coverage, even without Morrison. I don't, I don't know, but can Notre Dame move the ball? Navy has been shockingly good on defense. Notre Dame is kind of inept. Riley Leonard has had a terrible season. He's running the ball really well, but he's playing behind, you know, a shaky offensive line because of all their injuries. They have three guys that were projected to start that are out. Their receivers aren't very good. Like anytime Bo Collins is your number one, I guess one meaningful thing is Mitchell Evans did work into a much higher snap share. It's the first time we've seen that all year. He should be their wide receiver one when healthy. If he can actually sustain that, then I would have more interest in Notre Dame's passing attack, but they don't play Reggie Love all the time which is a problem. I don't know why they don't do that. There is a drop off from him to price, but yeah, man, I I don't know. I was considering this at 12. It took some buyback last night. I don't, I don't know if I want to lay like 14 in a really slow, greasy game. I know there's 12 and a half 13s out there. What about an under? That's reasonable. I don't know. I don't buy Navy's defense being this good. Neither do I. Sorry. No, neither do I. I just, you know, if it stays competitive early and Navy just starts trying to, I would assume Navy's strategy is just stay in it for as long as possible. Um, I thought this would come in a little lower, the number, to be honest. It was 52 yesterday. Has it moved? No, no it's around that um, still. See, there's a rogue 53. Wow. That's what I'm saying. That's like you, you get, you secure 28, 24. Not that that's going to, but 31, 21, like. I don't know. It's a really but, high scoring Navy game. Yeah. For like, you know, if Navy takes care of the ball and they stay in it and they're running even remotely, you know, Navy's going to have some success. It's probably going to be like 2.7 yards a carry. But if you have 45 carries, that'll chew up some clock. Yeah, I'm interested in this. You bring up a really good point. I don't know why I wasn't looking at the under. I, 
I'm just a little just... stunned because I don't believe in Notre Dame's offense equally as much as I don't believe in Navy's defense. So I don't What's believe that? in Navy's defense either. No, no, that's the biggest. Not long term. They've been. I mean, they're fine. G five defense. Yeah, like Navy's probably going to win seven or eight games. Maybe more. Maybe like nine or ten. I don't Even know. Natty. What happens if they win? Maybe. Yeah, if they win today. If they win on Saturday, I mean, like. Well, I mean, this conference is terrible. Them and Army going to have to play twice. Yeah, that's the situation everyone wants to talk about. I would. It's not going to happen. Army, yeah. his schedule has been even worse than Navy's. Ar- but, Army. Army plays UAB every week, which is a, a loophole in the system. But I mean, this conference is horrible. It's very bad. Yeah, it's I very mean, bad. It's, everyone got pillaged from it. But all the teams that used to be good outside of Memphis, who has no defense, are just horrible right now. Like East Carolina is firing their coach. They were supposed to make some noise. FAU, I don't know what the hell they did this offseason. Couldn't get anybody to go there. Charlotte tried to spend a ton of money in the portal. They all got really hurt really fast. North Texas, like five guys in their secondary got arrested this offseason. Rice is a disaster. EJ Warner can't do anything. South Florida, their own line did not take any sort of a step forward. Temple's Temple. Tulane is probably the biggest threat to Memphis. Tulane's yeah. actually been pretty good. Like Tulsa stinks. UTSA is a disaster compared to what they used to be. And UAB somehow still hasn't fired their coach. This conference is horrible. It's quite bad. It's quite bad. Well, we're moving back to the SEC here. Uh, again, under a pass for me, by the way, in Notre Dame. Missouri and Alabama, no margin for error here. I know, obviously, Alabama, it's not working right now, but they win their games, they're going to make it, no doubt about it. I just, you can't be losing more. And I'm I'm a little concerned. I thought they should have beat Tennessee, uh, and they didn't. So credit to Tennessee for getting the job done. I don't know what's going on with Missouri. I, I the Again, Auburn only plays an insane game, so I have to take that. This is inside two touchdowns back in Tuscaloosa. Now or never, really, for Alabama. You think they show anything? Yeah, but they have a lot of concerns, man. And, you know, I I had a pretty good week, one of my better ones this year, thankfully, because I've had some really bad ones. But this was not one of the bright spots of it, taking Alabama. Yeah, I had them too. I was very, very disappointed in what they put on the field. And they have a – Milrow had his worst game all season. Definitely. Definitely. There were some throws that were open. He just, he flat out missed. And his efficiency metrics took a huge step down. Still, I mean, Mil- Milrow's underlying stuff is very good. He has six interceptions and five turnover worthy plays, which it's always baffling to me how this can happen at certain points in time. But he's one of those guys who's run really cold. And I mean, how many of these interceptions have we seen? The Vandy one is the one that stands out the most where like that tip pick six in the Vandy game. That was nuts. But yeah, O-line has been shuffling still. Getting Caden Proctor back is awesome. But like Tennessee has an amazing pass rush. They did a great job schematically finding Alabama's weak links and then taking advantage of those because they don't have five stalwarts in the offensive line. Getting back Proctor has helped them. But when you have teams that are smart and well-coached, they'll just exploit the weaknesses. And they've been doing that. On the defense... Didn't help that Devontae Smith, their nickel, got hurt in-game. Keon Sab, another safety, hurt in-game. And then Zabian Brown had a couple really bad plays, and they benched him. So they were down like three guys that started this game in the secondary. Not that Iamaleava really took a ton of advantage of that, where Tennessee actually had success was on the ground, 5.3 yards per carry. That's another concern on its own. But, I mean, all these things should be concerns heading into the Missouri game. Missouri hasn't played the best schedule, but their defense has largely stood up outside of AM. and They're tenth in pass rush. If they're well coached enough, they should be able to find holes in Alabama's offensive line, who comes in 88th in run blocking now, 43rd in pass blocking. By the way, they, they don't have a running back who's competent on the team. But Missouri's defense has been fine. They did lose Khalil Jacobs at linebacker, and then I don't know why Joseph Charleston only played 24 of 65 snaps, which is a couple injuries worth noting. Again, I think... Alabama has bigger concerns on their defense with Smith, Sab, and Brown. And, of course, Otis redshirted at defensive tackle. Don't want to forget that. But then Missouri's also had a lot of injuries on offense all throughout the season. And it's largely players coming in and out of lineup, so it's hard to pinpoint. Luther Burden's been hurt at times this year. Brady Cook went to the hospital last week, somehow returned. They had Brett Norfleet playing through an injury last week. Nate Noel has had the back injury. 
if these guys can return to anything close to full strength, this offense we've seen over years is explosive and should be able to take advantage of an Alabama defense who's now been beat up by Tennessee, who had an egregious offense prior to this. Lenora Sellers, were, Sellers was at 7.7 .7 yards per attempt. Raheem Sanders at 4.9 yards per carry. Pavia at 12.6 yards per attempt through the air. And obviously, Beck ended up having a good game through the second half. This defense is a concern. And at the end of the day, I'm going to trust Brady Cook, Luther Burden, Theo Weiss, the tandem of running backs, and an O-line, which is still sixth in run blocking, 37th in pass blocking. That was the strength of their team coming in. If Bama wins, it's going to have to be a shootout-style game. In this current edition of Bama, I just think this is too many points. If you can find like a 14, I know it's in Tuscaloosa, but man, this is a lot of points. Definitely a lot of points. And again, it's Missouri. I don't know. I'm not even a Missouri backer. Neither like, am I. Just... Neither am I. They beat UMass. Um <laughs> That was a good get right game for them. That you can find a, you can find Missouri that. at 14 at minus 110 out there. That's what I took. Yeah. So it's out there. Uh I want to back Alabama, I really do. I'm just kind of have to I'm going to have to kind of pause on them. I'm, I'm probably staying away from the entire game to be honest. They've had uh, three consecutive games where they've looked really, at least not like the Bama we thought they were. Chances just Say completely crumbles. Chances they fire this guy. DeBoer? Yeah. It's like zero, right? I think so. I Probably not. And maybe like one person. Like what if they lose like five games, I'm saying? Then they might fire him. <laughs> oh, man. All right. That's another story for another time. Illinois. Oregon. You know, Illinois is pretty good at times. They were the ugliest helmets I've ever seen last week, and they still managed to win. Now they got to go out. I mean, Oregon doesn't mess around now. There was no letdown. Ever need to cool it with the letdown spot. Purdue, you can't let down against Purdue. It's not possible. Even well, if people saying that. Well, people are like, oh, this is the ultimate trap game. Like, it, you can't have a trap if there's no trap. Like, they stepped in the trap, but there's it's Purdue. Purdue is just not a team that can trap you. Uh Oregon could have won that game by 70 points if they wanted to. Now they're three touchdown spread. I assume you think they keep it rolling, but is there anything actionable here? Yeah, I think they keep it rolling. This is the classic game that I hate betting. Does Oregon want to win by 21 and a half or not? I, I still have a ton of concerns with the underlying Illinois stuff. And perhaps this is just a hole at some point because they continue to win games. I am not impressed really by anything they do. They beat Michigan, who continues to cycle through their three quarterbacks. I mean, it's great. You beat it. You at least scored 21 on a good defense. I'll give them that. But then Purdue in overtime, that's a disaster. They lost by 14 to Penn State, who should have probably lost to USC. They beat Nebraska, who just got absolutely annihilated by Indiana. And then their other wins are Central Michigan, Kansas, who has two wins. Like, I don't know what this team has really done that's super impressive on the schedule. I think it's impressive they came out unscathed. I would not have projected this. But still, I think there's like a hole you could poke in every single win of th this team has outside of, you know, the FCS team. Underlying, they're 103rd in pass blocking, 83rd in run blocking. That's the first concern for me. You're facing Oregon, who's 16th in pass rush. And somehow they've been able to get after the quarterback even without Birch, which at some point I expect him to return. But Mateo Uagalale, like this team has awesome defensive linemen. They're going to get after Oregon better than, or excuse me, after Illinois better than any team has so far this year. They're also second in coverage, and Jabbar Muhammad left their game for a little bit. Thankfully, he came back, so I think he's going to be fine in this contest, and maybe they choose to sit him because Illinois is Illinois. But underlying all this, we talked about it last week, Luke, Luke Altmaier running hotter than the sun with turnover worthy plays, nine of them on the year. Only one has been converted to an interception. Unbelievable. This offensive line is allowing a 40% pressure rate on 40% of Altmaier's dropbacks. He's getting pressured. They already lost Caden Fagan for the year at running back. I guess their replacements are reasonable, but it's not a good unit by any means. So I don't know how they score a lot of points on this Oregon defense. In fact, I don't think they have a lot of success doing so. And then Oregon should be able to do whatever they want against this defense. Illinois is one tenth in run defense. Like good luck stopping Jordan James. They allowed 4.6 yards per carry to Khalil Mullings. 
which is only noteworthy because you know exactly what Michigan's doing on every single play. Prior to that, 9.3 yards per carry to Devin Mockaby, 5.3 to Reggie Love of Purdue, 5.7 and 5.9 to Katrin Allen and Nick Singleton of Penn State. They did a decent job against Nebraska, but then 8.2 yards per carry to Miles Bailey of Central Michigan, 7.2 to Devin Neal. This run defense is horrifying, and it makes sense. They've lost all their defensive tackles like Jerzon Newton to the NFL. Oregon's going to ram it right down their throat. This offensive line, 60th in run pass blocking, 58th in run blocking. They had success running the ball against Ohio State. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't see any way Illinois stops this. It's just like the hook always makes me nervous. You know, if it's a 21 yep. and a half, I, the pace is not good in this game. Both are below average. You're kind of relying on explosiveness for Oregon and them not taking their foot off the gas. See what I can find here because I had an angle, but I'm not sure if it's up yet. Team total stuff. Yeah, team total stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, over 37 and a half for Oregon. I think that's completely live. So Illinois is at what then? Illinois, it's got to be like 17. Yeah, 16 and a half, 17. You also could go, this is what I was looking for too. I, I wouldn't mind Oregon. First half, minus 12 and a half. Like, I, I do think they build the, they've built a comfortable halftime lead in a lot of these blowout games. Um, yeah, I don't mind that. I don't mind that either. I might play that. I want to get rid of this Illinois team once yeah. and for all. I hear that. Um, all right, let's keep it moving. Ah, yes, SMU and, and Duke. Sure, Duke. Quietly just going to win like 14 games this year as the 70th best team. In the country, but th this is a big game. A lot of, a lot of respect. Now secrets out. All I heard was SMU's garbage. Turned out, I mean, they still should have beat BYU. That's another story for another time. This spread is bouncing all over the place. There's a ten and a half out there, and then everyone else has moved to twelve. Uh, obviously, I'd be on the SMU side. Are you on the SMU side? Yeah, my recommendation is take that ten and a half if you can. I took yeah. it on. I don't know yesterday sometime. But man, everywhere. What is that? It moved everywhere. Except one, there's a rogue 10 and a half out there, but there's a 12, 12, 12 and a half, 11 and a half. So yeah, this is why you want to shop it. I think SMU smashes Duke. Yes. I have no interest in this Duke team long-term. They played an easy schedule. They've been lucky to get the Rick. They should have lost to Northwestern. I mean, they, so they won by six in that game. They won by five against UConn. Middle Tennessee State is a bottom 10 team in the country. They beat North Carolina in a game. They had a 39% postgame win expectancy. That's not a good team. Then they lost to Georgia Tech, and they just played Florida State, who was alternating between their backup and third-string quarterbacks, neither of whom can throw a forward pass. I mean, this is like the 112th-ranked schedule in the country, and you already lost to a team on it and should have three losses. Anyway, to actually talk about Duke's players, I'm no Malik Murphy guy, never have been, probably never will be, after his – Failed stint at Texas with three NFL receivers. Very surprised it's even gone this well with Duke. And they've had a good offensive line efficiency-wise. They're 16th in pass blocking, 65th at run blocking. I just come back to who have you played that generates any pass rush. So I don't think it's bad. It's just a question. Then on offense, they have a lot of players hurt right now. They obviously lost Hasley at tight end for the year. Nikki Dalmolin, he missed their last game. So you're down your top two there. Jordan Moore has been hurt for a while and he's been playing on a severely limited snap count. I wish they would like, if you're a Duke fan, why would you just not sit him out of a game and hopefully get him back rather than trying to play him through the injury? But anyway, he's been playing like 14 snaps a game. He's their wide receiver one. Jack has Moore hasn't been playing much. They've turned fully to star Thomas and they also haven't had a starting linebacker, Nick Morris. I, I can't believe this team has been able to get through all this unscathed. And the only real good data point I think you have is they stopped Haynes King. In that game, they still allowed 6.7 yards per carry to Jamal Haynes. SMU can do whatever they want on offense. This offense is elite. 19th in run blocking, 47th in pass blocking. Kevin Jennings has been a wagon. He only has two turnover-worthy plays, and both of them have been converted to interceptions. I mean, this guy is absolutely nuts. 5.2 yards per carry, 9.1 yards per attempt. O-line's keeping him clean. Rashard Smith has been awesome in the run game. They're doing a bunch of weird stuff, too. Roderick Daniels, who's like a Debo Samuel type guy, typically plays receiver. He's been getting a lot of carries efficiently. O-line's been perfect. 
They did lose RJ Maryland in their last game. I don't think it matters. His snap share has actually been pretty bad this year. He's at like 55%. And they've been using more 12 personnel than previously because they have like Hibner and these transfer tight ends. And then the other reason we loved SMU is this team added so many good transfers on defense. They're finally starting to play up to that caliber. They are seventh in total defensive efficiency, second against the run, 21st in pass rush, and 49th in coverage. This is an awesome team. Both teams play fast. That doesn't help Duke here. They're 30th in pace. SMU is 33rd. I think SMU just might smash this team. No arguments. Big fan of SMU. They've hit their stride. Dark horse in the ACC. I still believe that. Uh, and Duke's no good. Wisconsin's found something. You should be excited. You're a little excited. They've been playing much better. Um, I mean, they played the three worst teams in the Big Ten in three consecutive weeks. I think they have a real shot here. Uh, do you? Six and a half point spread. Penn State comes to town. I'm. Uh, I think I'm going to be holding off from betting these these mid range Big Ten games for at least a week or two until we get more information because Penn state should have smashed USC. And instead they let USC nearly win the game. And probably based on, like I say, Penn state should have smashed USC just from like a metrics perspective before the game. But I mean, that's why you play the games because sometimes you get crazy outcomes. USC deserved to win based on the actual play on the field. Kotal Nicky. I'm almost worried that he has too much time on his hands with the bye week coming into this. When the guy gets extra time, he just dresses up the offense so much with so many bells and whistles, and it's a complete disaster sometimes. He has one good receiver on this team. It's their tight end, Tyler Warren, and he's an absolute wagon. But, I mean, Julian Fleming is an absolute disaster on offense. Luckily, he was able to redeem himself with, like, a single big catch at the end of the USC game because he had so many drops on the way. He's the reason, like, they were in that situation to begin with. The receivers are horrible on this team. Aller is up and down. The O-line has been reasonable. They're 70th in pass blocking, 34th in run blocking. I think that's kind of their ceiling given their their losses. But he's averaging over a first down every time he drops back. Four turnover-worthy plays. All four have been converted to interceptions. There might be some room for improvement here. And I'm not really buying anything Wisconsin has done right now until they play a real team. Like they got absolutely dissected by Milrow. They lost to USC, and they allowed a ton of production to Miller Moss in that game. And then their three wins are against Purdue, a Rutgers team who is really hurt, and Northwestern who can barely throw the ball and lost their number one receiver immediately in the game. So I just – Braden Locke has eight turnover-worthy plays already this year. Five have been converted interceptions. It's about what you'd expect. I guess the only real worry you have if you're like a Penn State fan is Wisconsin's O-line has been playing elite football. They're like a top 10 unit in the country right now. They're sixth in pass blocking, 27th in run blocking. It doesn't matter who Wisconsin's putting back there. Tawi, Yacomelli, I mean, Dupree, they're all having success. But Penn State's strength on defense is their front. I don't know if you're going to have success here. Like a lot of USC success, which is mind-blowing to me, was on these stupid reverses and misdirection things, which are literally just like coaching and discipline. If you're in the right spot, those things don't happen. On true rush sets, Penn State was actually pretty good defending them. They're 17th at defending the run in the country. I'm not really trusting Braden Locke to win me a game. He's been fine. But, yeah, man, I, I to me this is Penn State or pass, and I'm fully leaning into the pass. I'm not sure there's a number you could actually get me to bet this game right now. If this goes to seven, I'm, I'm betting Wisconsin. It's at Camp Randall. It is. I think this is the toughest spot Penn State has been in this year. I don't disagree. Like, I really don't. West Virginia is just no good. Illinois at home, like, I don't think that that's that crazy. I don't think USC is any good. Um, Penn State is- should have been able to just ram it down their throats every single play, and they lot. chose not to do it. Like, what? I won't swear. What in the world was Kotelnicki doing in that game? I don't. This is a challenge. We'll see. It's a good test for both teams. If it goes to seven firing texas and vanderbilt obviously like i said two teams that control their destiny to the playoff no problem um i would seriously doubt at this point anybody is looking past vanderbilt but i seriously doubt that texas isn't anything but focused after having to lick their wounds against georgia that happens they were not humiliated but you know big game at home they weren't able to get it done 
Now they got to hit the road. I assume they'll have a plan for Pavia. You'd have to think so, but I don't know. Pavia has played weird. well in just about every game this year. In fact, he has played extremely well in every game this year, and no one has found a way to stop him. This is the best defense Pavia will have faced, though, which is kind of crazy considering the SEC schedule they've played. Kentucky, Bama, Missouri hasn't been easy sledding, but I kind of think Texas defense is legit. They stifled Carson Beck last week, and the only real hole I could poke is Georgia's offensive line is still really hurt. I thought they would stand up just fine, but Texas defensive line got home routinely and caused a ton of problems for Beck. Beck was at 4.3 yards per attempt. He had three picks in the game. Like Texas defense might be for real. Coming into last week, all we could really say is they hadn't played anybody. They answered every question. But were they like a top 20 unit or were they the number one unit in the country, which is where power rankings had them? I, th I think they might be like top five, man. This But they did. To it, and they, it's crazy they lost that game with their defense playing so well. I mean, this defense is so good. And Vanderbilt does have holes. Pavi has been a wizard. I can't believe they've been as successful as they've been. They're 118th in pass blocking, 85th in run blocking. They do run a gimmicky offense. So they kind of have, you know, the Navy Army effect where they're not an offense that's easy to prepare for. And they do have some quality skill position players. People like to think Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt is completely devoid of talent. This team is like 35th in recruiting every year. They have four stars on their team. People just, I don't know, think they're like Navy's roster, even though they're not. But I don't know. At some point, we just have to back Pavia. He is one turnover-worthy play all season long, one, and it has been converted to an interception. Nine yards per attempt. He's averaging over four yards per carry, and this is all despite what's around him. So I don't know. I think Vanderbilt is the side I prefer. I did take it 18 and a half. I regret taking that number, certainly. Just diving into Texas's defense, they might be awesome. But the value of the point is going to be big here. Vanderbilt is also 132nd in pace. That doesn't help their opponents. It just creates volatility. And when you have a guy who's as good as Pavia, it works to their advantage. The only concern I have with Texas, I guess, aside from maybe there being a weaker data point with Georgia's hurt offensive line, is just the quarterback. But the fact that they couldn't play a quarterback that could move the ball is why they lost the game. Straight up. I would bench Ewers. He had a horrifying game. So that – I thought they made a mistake for the long-term health of the team, but maybe maybe I'm wrong. By putting like, him back? No, by taking – if you're going to move, you have to be willing, I think, to like literally turn the page on the season because now – Every time Ewers plays somewhat bad, what are you going to do? Turn to Arch? I don't. I, I don't would just turn that. to Arch full time. You can do that. That I think is completely acceptable. You have to be will. You can't do the like SMU thing. Well, SMU figured it out. Yeah, they pick. You're going to have to pick one. That's what I'm saying. I don't. Ewers has bad metrics. He's nine turnover worthy plays, five big time throws. That's not any different than last year. The only difference is like last year, he had four NFL pass catchers, and now this year he might have two. I mean, he can't win them a game, or at least he hasn't been able to. When they've won big games, it's been in spite of him. It's been when he's been able to just like put the ball in the skill position players right in their, in their hands, and then they go and do the work. But now, like your skill position players are a little weaker. I mean, you go from like Jatavian Sanders and Xavier Worthy. Jordan Whittington has somehow found his way into the NFL field. Now you have Isaiah Bond, who's That's fine. Good. He's been hurt. He's going to be drafted highly. But like Matthew Golden, they have a lot of young players, and maybe they turn into something. But it's not the veterans they had last year. And you also don't have an NFL running back. Jaden Blue can't stop fumbling. Like maybe Wisner is an NFL running back. It's just too early to tell. But they go like from Jonathan Brooks to this. I don't know. It's it's like slightly weaker. So Ewers has to elevate a little more and he just hasn't been able to do it. Not saying he can't. He hasn't done it yet. And it's been a concern because Arch has been better. Flat Arch out. Better. Like, Arch no can move. Arch has better efficiency. I don't know, man. They, Texas kind of has a nice problem. They might have like, I don't know, two top 20 quarterbacks in the country. But when you're playing another top 20 team, that's a difference in you winning and losing a game. And Quinn Ewers lost them the game last week. It's going to be fascinating, Sark. Uh, you can only use your throw shit on the field strategy once, and they already did that. So they're going to have to figure something out. Um, <laughs> or they, did, 
Is it true that they were like revoking tickets after that? What they did. I've never seen a situation. I mean, I, I was on Georgia, so I was very upset, but I've never seen a situation like that in my life. Um, anyway, that's neither here nor there. All right, I might couple- buy out of my Vanderbilt. That's what I'll say. I would not recommend playing this. I what did about- quickly because the metrics, like overall power rankings at Vanderbilt 39th, Texas 7th, just based on the numbers, that should not be a 19 point spread. But I'm also very nervous with Texas defense being so good. So I I would rather just stay away right now. I don't know what I'm going to do. Hold on. Hold on. I want to see something here. And then we'll get to BYU. Another, this is another game. What about it? Real quick. What about an under? 53 and a half. Yeah, that's down from 54. Vanderbilt's defense is bad. That's it that. is, but <laughs> tempo wise, like tempo is bad in this game. Vanderbilt's gonna bring this to a crawl. Crawl and Texas defense. I could see them allowing sub ten points for sure. The other thing about Vandy is I I wouldn't look too much at their last game. They literally just like held guys out against. Oh them. yeah, I know. I screwed that up. They were just like if Vanderbilt up. had a bunch of starters out, and it was very clear they're just like, all right. Texas on deck, like who cares about Ball State? And yep. All right. BYU, one of the undefeated teams here, goes to the bounce house. BYU is obviously a fine team, but I think it's pretty clear that they, they're certainly mortal. Oklahoma State had them, and Oklahoma State's no good. This is a pseudo pick them. UCF mm-hmm. is not the team that I thought they could be, but they still got enough probably to knock off BYU here. Do you have a spot in this game? I want to run some stuff by you and see what you think. Because we have to deal with the small samples of UCF changing quarterbacks to yep. Curry Brown. He's been better as a rusher than KJ. I think there's almost no doubt about that. He's averaging 8.7 yards per carry. He is 330 yards. He's basically played in two games, which is nuts. And then underlying, two turnover-worthy plays. Both have been converted to interceptions. He is a 53% completion for 5.9 yards per attempt. But I like – because he had a wildly bad game just looking at the box score last game. But it's almost – so bad that you can't believe it, especially when he he has like three big time throws, two turnover worthy plays. So I went and I really dove into this. He had 20 dropbacks, 12 of them were downfield, zero of the ones past 20 yards were completed, and there were seven of those. Like he almost threw beyond 20 yards 50% of his pass attempts, and they completed zero of them. Like, what in the world are they doing? They're literally just running the ball like nearly 75% of the time and then taking a deep shot with really bad receivers. So like, I legitimately don't have an answer for this. That's that's it. It's very concerning, but when they ran the ball, they were wildly successful and I don't really see that changing much. BYU's defense is 52nd. They're 48th against the run 58th in coverage. So it's like pretty middling defense overall. It's actually very surprising. They've been able to have this run out. But Jacuri's awesome. Obviously, you have Harvey in the backfield. He's awesome. O-line is great. 12th in pass blocking, 38th in run blocking. They should have success running the ball in this game. Plus, they have a wild home field advantage, and BYU has a nasty road trip down to the bounce house. But on the other side, I mean, can you stop UCF's offense if it's super one-dimensional? Maybe. I think there's a chance Ja'Curry Brown is better than that horrifying game last week, and it was just a poor design game plan, having him throw downfield so many times. And then on the other side, I think UCF's defense has been a little underrated. They're 37th overall, 31st in coverage, 45th against the run. Like, it's a pretty balanced unit. They did have a couple guys get injured. Nigel Lee Kelly was injured in-game, and Isaiah Nixon as well. They're both two edge rushers, so make sure you watch them. I don't know if we've had an update yet. As of last night, we did not. But those are two good players. It's worth mentioning. But Retzlaff has run pretty hot, too. He has nine turnover-worthy plays already. That's sort of coming to an end recently. And, I mean, it's a good defense on the other side. I tentatively favor UCF. But I just don't know if I can back an offense that has, like, they're volatile. I'll say that. Like, if they don't hit a big play or if they crowd the box, BYU that is, and successfully stop the run, like, UCF might – lose this game by 21. They also might win by 21. Big range of outcomes. I'm waiting, but if it gets to three, I think I'm going to take UCF. I would certainly take UCF at three. 
It's pushing two and a half at a couple spots. That's weird because uh, I'm pretty sure that's what it opened at. And then UCF yeah. took money really fast and it was down to one. And now it's and buying it, back. Yeah. And then it went way, but it like flew back up. So I don't know. Three is a go for me. Three is a go for me as well. All right. We got one game left. Then we're getting out of here. Kansas, Kansas State's been relegated to the Thursday show, which you can you can see there. But I do want to mention, we don't talk about uh, portfolio EV a ton on this show, but sometimes things are are too pertinent to pass up. And, and listen, it's the start of NBA. It's not just NBA. NHL is going on. College football, NFL. If you have not seen these tools, I'm not saying overhaul what you do. I bet a lot of sides and a lot of totals, but there is no doubt that if you are interested in props and seeing volume appear on the board, Portfolio EV and what it can do is a game changer. And we are offering it. It's just, again, there's a flash sale for a dollar with the code dunk. The link will be in the description of this video. If you go to oddshopper.com, you're going to see a huge banner ad that says get Portfolio EV with a dollar. Use the code dunk. It's that simple. I mean, honestly, even if you don't have a lot of interest in this, Come on in for the week and take advantage of the dollar and then decide uh, what you want to do long term. It's it's that powerful of a situation. Couldn't be more excited. I will be using the tools. I've been using them. I use them every day to, to bolster my portfolio. That's what the concepts are behind it. And again, these tools are serious business. Uh, not that, but this. I mean, the results speak for themselves and you can get access to all these EV metrics that we have for all sports, all books, all filters all part of it so we'll see you guys in there again just really cool stuff it's a great time to be part of odd chopper great time to talk about cincinnati and colorado probably my best bet last week just in terms of getting one right was colorado i don't really understand why they were underdog and arizona's not good you, you identified that when they struggled with the fcs opponent for a while and and it showed cincinnati Actually looked pretty good. Arizona State had some injuries. So it's a cool game. But back in Boulder, does Colorado keep it going? I was. Were you surprised by the number? If, now it's like five and a half in a lot of spots. I was surprised Colorado's getting that much respect. It is at home, but man. So am I surprised? Yeah, if you just asked me. But I'm not surprised just given it's Colorado and it's Cincinnati. Like Colorado coming off a road spot as an underdog where they won comfortably. Come home. People want to bet them. I'm not surprised that this is starting to get a little inflated. I get. I I think a lot of people just hate Colorado now. Yeah, um, they they definitely do hate them. But <laughs> I mean, I'm not the biggest Colorado fan. I'll be honest. I don't really like them. But I mean, I I think they're they were underrated heading into the preseason. But that's very different from actually liking them and liking what Dion's doing. But yeah. Oh I mean, yeah, that's also. I mean. They seem to have gotten out of that game unscathed, though, in terms of unless I missed something. What, what do you make of the matchup, just stylistically? Brennan Soresby's been really good this year, man. And this Cincinnati offense has quietly been one of the better ones in the country. And maybe once they start playing more marquee opponents, we'll see it. But, I mean, this team has went over UCF. Their defense is going to get them in problems as it's done multiple times this year. Like they should have beat Pitt. I mean, very, very frustrating game there. So perhaps it's just that they've had a couple of letdown spots where people aren't onto them quite as much. But Soresby's at 67% completion, 8.3 yards per attempt, 13 scores, four picks. Run kind of poor on those. He has five turnover worthy plays. Only one of them hasn't been converted. The O line for this team is very good 33rd in pass blocking, 57 and 52nd in run blocking. They've had a couple injuries in the offensive line, but it's kind of like one guy's in for a game, then someone else has to step up for them. They've six players return with starting experience, so that hasn't really affected them. Last week, one of their guards only played limited time, but again, I don't think that's a big deal. And Colorado's defense has been better than people suggest. They're 51st overall, 29th against the run, 43rd in coverage. So it's a pretty good unit, but man, Cincinnati's had a lot of success this year against some pretty decent defenses at that. I don't know if their defense can stop Colorado. Somehow they're 33rd overall and 23rd in coverage, which is a bit surprising to me. But when you look like situationally, they have allowed production to a couple quarterbacks in like in between. They face Donovan Smith and Jeff Sims. So I kind of think those numbers are inflating this. 10.4 yards per attempt to Ja'Cory Brown for UCF. 8.7 to Baron Morton at Texas Tech. 9.7 to Brett Gabbard of Miami, Ohio. And 8.6 to Eli Holstein at Pitt. 
even if they're a little better than some of the numbers they've allowed, Shador should have no problem here. I think they're unscathed. They did a really weird thing with Travis Hunter, and I think everyone was really excited for the Travis Hunter, Tech McMillan matchup. Travis Hunter only played 10 snaps on defense. It didn't matter. They still couldn't yep. get the ball moving through the air. So I don't, I don't know. We'll have to see where he comes in. Maybe we'll get a report or something. Dion called it, what did he say? Like maintenance, I think was the word he used, something like that. Yeah, they didn't need him. Yeah, he played a ton on offense. But, you know, like Cincinnati's defense is not going to rush the passer. That's really the way you have to get after Colorado. So that line should be relatively decent in this game. Shador shouldn't be under as much pressure. The receivers outside of Hunter are all fully healthy, and I think there's a good chance Hunter's healthy. That just creates unique problems for a defense like Cincinnati who hasn't faced a ton of great quarterbacks, and when they have, they've gotten beat. At the same time, like I think Brennan Soresby keeps him in this game. He's been awesome, and Colorado has enough cracks on defense, even though they've been better, where I think it's getting to the point where I would debate a Cincinnati. Haven't played it yet. Might have to get to like a seven for a real serious consideration, but I don't know. Maybe we're getting a little out of our skis in Colorado. You hear those horns? What the hell's going on out there? What's or- that? Oh, I do. I live on a busy street, so it's Oof. like you get fire trucks, you get the trash guys, you get horns, you horns. get people screaming. You guys haven't heard that yet. That'll be screaming. it's early in the morning. If we do a night show, sometimes you'll get the people Oof. screaming. I gotta watch. I was watching Showdown last night. I didn't hear anyone screaming um, <laughs> for a two-game slate, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, well, if there is, uh, you know, could be road rage, could be an altercation. Best way to defuse an altercation is always cooler heads prevail. You give them value. You take both people who are very heated in this incident, and you say, listen, instead of getting mad at each other, let's get mad at the books. Here's a couple college football bets for you to calm the horns, to calm the altercations. If that situation arises tonight, what are you going to tell him to defuse what could be a, a very dangerous situation on the streets of Wisconsin? My two favorites are the under in LSU, Texas A&M. I took a 54. And then SMU versus Duke, I took an SMU minus 10 and a half. And I know that one is moved. There is a 10 and a half still out there. If you can't yes. get it, I think 12 is fine. I would be semi-considering like all stuff here. I think there's a chance SMU smashes Duke. I'm taking the under in the Navy Notre Dame game. I think that Navy's defense can hold up to the extent that if you don't allow explosive plays, the tempo will be so bad that Notre Dame can win 31 to 10 style, something like that, uh, and just keep it really, really ugly. And then honestly, I'm I want to again caveat. Wisconsin, if it gets to seven, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take a shot here that they can cause real problems. I like the way they're playing. Maybe I just don't understand how bad Rutgers is because they are bad. Um, but it, by the way, not to derail the best, best portion. Did you see what Rutgers defense allowed Garbers to do last week? They're down like five starters now. I, don't, <laughs> I can't. I can't with that. He had a 50-yard touchdown run. What? That's wild. That's nuts. He had negative 50 yards rushing against LSU, and then he had a 50-yard touchdown against your defense. Just give up at that point. Um, there we have it. Another one I'll just throw out very quickly. If UCF gets to three, I'm going, and we'll keep an eye on that. Again, it's one of the many reasons you want to get into our discords to find up the follow-ups. If you have questions, though, at JazzRazBets, at Matt underscore Gajeski on Twitter. We're here, we're available, and we're around. And as I told you guys, the links in the description of this video are for you. Find what value you're looking for and take advantage of it. We will be back in just a few days to talk about plenty more games. I see a couple on the screen. Wyoming, hint, hint, that's going to be a play. Uh, until then, friends, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate you guys. Hit the like button on your way out, and we'll talk to you soon.